Thank you very much for tuning in today and being with us in our second virtual coffee chat with a science diplomat. We are very excited to have Simone Pocher with us. Simone is the Director of Science of Technology uh, at the Embassy of Austria in Washington, D.C. Today we are going to drink our coffees together and talk about science, technology, partnership, opportunities, projects and her career paths and various topics on science diplomacy. So welcome, Simone, and thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, Daria. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you. Um, and I see that there is also so many of, of Austrian researchers of our RENA network here. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, it's my first time that I'm having a coffee chat, and I think there's one quick thing I want to mention. Um, what I have in here is actually not real coffee, so the coffee chat is not quite true for me. Um, I'm a chai drinker. Um, but if I'm forgiven, I'll be happy to share my recipe with anybody who's interested. So feel free to send me a message. Um, I'm sure somebody's going to post my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me for that as well. Thank you, Simone, for your willingness to share your recipe. Uh, I will be also delighted to try it sometime. Okay, so be yeah, sure. Before we get started, I want to say a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Daria Bifaner Karajan, and I am the program manager of EuroAccess North America. I am also a visiting researcher at George Washington University. With my colleague Jackson Howard, uh, our mission is to provide information and organize events on research funding, research careers, and collaboration opportunities with Europe in order to boost researcher mobility. Uh, our office links the European research area with the US and Canada. We are one of the eight Euro Access hubs around the world, uh, disseminating opportunities and researchers for researchers of all nationalities in all fields who want to create partnerships with Europe. So before we get started, I want to invite our audience to write their questions in the chat box so that we can get in towards the end. So Simon, let's start our chat. Uh, mm -hmm. You are the Director of uh, Office of Science and Technology at the Embassy of Austria, you say OSTA, right? So yes, you want, yeah, do you want to share a bit about yourself before we talk about what you do at your office? All right, about myself, sure. Um, look, a lot of people have those childhood dreams where they think about who they want to who they want to be when they grow up. Some people want to be a princess or a firefighter. Um, mm -hmm. For me, <laughs> throughout my throughout my education, and then when I was a teenager, I went through a few stages where I wanted to be a psychologist or a journalist. And um, truth be told, at that time, nobody knew, not even me, where it would end up. Right? When I when I think back about um, those deciding factors that took me to to where I am today as a science diplomat, I have to say that um, I think it really started back then with a wonderful English teacher. Um, who really loved the United States. And whenever he came back from summer vacation, um, he showed us photos of, well, actually it was slides that, that dates me a little bit. Um, we had like real slideshows um, of yeah. the Grand Canyon, of cities around the world. And he told us the stories about his adventures and I just loved it. Um, and so for me, um, I always knew I wanted to come to the United States. And when it was time for me to go to university, I decided to study communications um, with a focus on marketing, and obviously I started I studied English as well. Um, the U.S. was never far from my dreams, even at that age. Um, and uh, later on, I got a degree in project management and financial management. Um, I think in regards to career path, the type of roles that I worked on um, included PR agencies, I uh, worked at a university in Austria, also in industry. Um, and at one point, even with a management consulting agency. Um, and uh, Daria, during those experiences, uh, I identified a few things that are really important to me in life, right? I love meeting people from all walks of life. I love connecting them to new opportunities. I do value learning, um, learning something new every single day. And in my role, I get to do that. Um, and I also want to have a positive impact on people with the work that I do. And um, with my role here at OSPA, I get to do these things every single day. I'm quite lucky. Um, yeah. We've never known that being a science diplomat is, is, is such a rewarding um, experience and, and role. Wow. I think you're lucky. <laughs> that, uh, 
when you were a child, you were knowing what you're going to do in the future. So you talk about your early education and career progression, but I want to learn uh, how your current position. You know, your office is supported by three Austrian federal ministries, yeah. Minister of European and International Affairs, Minister mm -hmm. of Education, Science and Research, and Minister of Digital and Economic Affairs. I think it's right. And uh, you are the part of the embassy here in Washington, D.C. Yeah, so as right. I know, this is a unique uh, setup structure. So can you tell us why, uh, I mean, what's the reason and uh, what are you, your areas of responsibility? Right. Um, so the OSTA construct is, is quite a unique one and we're really proud of it. Um, we have so many interdisciplinary stakeholders in Austria that are interested in science and in science and diplomacy. Um, that's an excellent thing for us. It's not only the, in, like the, the equivalent in the US would be the State Department, our Ministry of European and International Affairs that's, that's supporting us, but also the Ministry for Education, Science and Research and the Ministry for Digital and Economic Affairs. Um, so that's a very unique construct when you look at uh, other offices of European counterparts um, here at embassies in Washington, D.C. In regards to the responsibilities you ask about, uh, maybe basing that on our mission um, would be a good idea. For our mission, we build bridges for research and innovation between Austria and North America. So it's that transatlantic connection that's at the center that, of everything that we do. And um, we facilitate international relationships and focus on strengthening research and innovation through transatlantic collaborations. Um, for us, often the classic notion of diplomacy comes in here with the with the responsibilities and the approaches um, that we have. You know, on one side we promote um, information exchange between the stakeholders in Austria and uh, those in North America, but we also monitor and report on developments in science, technology, and engineering in North America. Um, we help facilitate transatlantic collaborations, maybe at a university level or as mobility of researchers is concerned. Um, and this is something also good. Um, we, we do shine the light on Austria's accomplishments in science, technology, and innovation. Um, Daria, you know Austria is quite a small country if you're looking at it relatively to the United States or Canada. Um, our population is about 8.96 million. And, um, if you're looking at the type of employees in Austria that work in R&D, um, you can tell that we're very research focused. We have about 126,000 employees that work in R&D and um, 40,000 researchers that work in Austrian academia. So that's that's quite excellent. And we want um, American stakeholders, North American stakeholders know about that. Um, and, you know, and, and um, when you're looking at the science, diplomacy approaches there is like one tool that i want to mention here specifically um it's managing our research and innovation network that's at the heart of everything that we do rena um that's a network of austrian researchers in north america and um for austria that's quite an important tool to support the science diplomacy efforts that we have with with north america yeah Oh, thank you. And uh, I mean, as I see, you have a really wide scope of responsibilities. Uh, but uh, you mentioned Rina, but since it's uh, still a very fairly unique mechanism, as I see, and deals yeah. with new approach. So I would like to learn more about the Rina network. Can you tell us a bit more about it? Sure. So Rina was started in about 2001 when we only had about a few dozen scientists. Um, Austrian researchers identified at that point. Um, since then, ARENA has grown into a network of over 3,500 Austrian scientists and innovators in North America. We also have wonderful alumni who get supported by that network. And um, what's very important to us, not just as OSTA, we cover science diplomacy in Canada, the United States, and Mexico, but also through ARENA, we support Austrian researchers who are in these three countries. Mm -hmm. um, something um, that we're really proud of, Daria, and, and I think you know that because I've been to a lot of your events and, and you know some of my researchers. Um, RENA is a very interdisciplinary network. We, we welcome scientists from all academic disciplines. We have geologists, material scientists, um, 
AI researchers, historians, and you know, now with what's going on with COVID-19, a lot of interaction with our immunologists and neurologists, people in the life sciences field. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, what's uh, also special about ARENA, um, and you noted as well, Daria, that it's super important to put a value on connecting industry with academia so that we can foster technology transfer. transfer. Um, for us, ARENA is also an intersectorial network. Um, our members are working in higher education institutes at, right, at private research institutions. Um, a lot of startups yeah. that we have, many in Silicon Valley, many in New York, Boston, um, different regional priorities, obviously. Um, also people that work for government research institutions or non-government institutions. And we're really proud um, also that ARENA members are scientists from all career levels. It starts with our students, goes to associate professors, then mid-career level uh, scientists, all the way up to uh, professors emeritus, um, our Nobel laureates, and if you're looking at the technology field, uh, chief technology officers. So we're all inclusive. There, There is no researcher that's Austrian that wouldn't fit within what it is that we offer. Wow, you're really doing <laughs> really good things. I mean, and you're reaching not hundreds, thousands of people, and your network is really huge. Yeah, and I it's see growing. That yeah, it's growing, and with the, I mean, uh, for a country, a very small country, the numbers are really, I think, good and very important. It might be a good example also for the other countries as well. I'm going to ask it later on, but uh, I want to <laughs> learn more about Rina. You know, Rina has a very important mission, as I understood. Mm -hmm. So, what makes Rina, you said, Research and Innovation Network Austria, special? Why is it different? Okay, so I see so many of my members uh, logged in here today. It's the people, no question about it. It's the people, it's our members. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the diversity, the excellence in research, um, and maybe I'd also say the personal touch that we have through Rena. You know, um, there, are, there are so many networks out there in today's digital world, right? Um, for me, I, I often feel overwhelmed just by the big number of groups that I'm part of, the professional networks, the social media groups, the databases, subscription lists that I get messages from. Um, and oftentimes I feel that for many of them, I'm just, you know, a name or an email address uh, and people don't really care about me. And um, we're working very hard to make this different for Rena. For us, the personal component is super, super important. Um, mm -hmm. It's a network where we know or we try to know our members personally. Um, we want to find out what it is that they do, um, what it is that they need from us, how their needs change, right? It's such a busy, busy world today with things just moving in all directions in science, technology, and engineering. So people's needs also change. And um, I think it's very important for developing networks and making them efficient and helpful for everybody in there um, to actually facilitate personal and authentic connections. You know, go back in time a little bit, um, away from technology, back to the face-to-face -face where we can have real exchanges and interactions. And, and um, maybe for Rena, I want to say that for us, the network is the people, um, but not just the people, but also it is what the people make of it. And in our case, we have so many engaged students, scientists, professors, innovators, entrepreneurs um, that give back to the network that actively want to be part of it. And um, I think that supporting these people is, is the most important ingredient in build it, building successful communities. And for us as Austria in driving transatlantic collaborations, obviously, since this is something that is our main focus as well. Um, Mm -hmm. in what we do with our mission yeah thank you and uh, while i was listening to you i thought that this is also a bit similar to what we do as Rexis north mm -hmm. america i think you're familiar with what we are doing besides uh, our activities related to resource mobility and career development we at the same time connect with the european scientific diaspora groups mm -hmm. in north america and um, provide career development through training and uh, some webinars and organize networking events. 
for instance, every year we organize the annual meeting of the European Scientific Diaspora. And uh, love that one. <laughs> yeah, and we've always been part of it. Yeah, that's that's you know your events, Daria. Um, they're amazing on a European scale. They help us network, uh, connect with also researchers from other countries, and I know that's how Austin Eurox have come to have come to working together so frequently and so often on different projects. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, we are happy to host you. I mean, not only <laughs> you and different uh, scientific diasporas, and we know the importance of your mission, especially in the US. Uh, so I'm very happy also with that. Unfortunately, we are not going to, you know, have that live events in this year during the current, you know, situation because of the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah. But let's see. Yeah. I mean, um, so when we go on our questions, so I'm also wondering what kind of support do you offer through this network? And uh, I mean, what is it that you actually do for the network members? I mean, you explain the general structure. Yeah. But what are you doing? What are your projects? How do you connect yeah. them? Yep. Well, some of them are, are, are quite similar to what you just said there. Some of them that Euraxis offers as well, right? You work one on one with your researchers and research administrators um, to help them with funding opportunities, you host events, webinars, and all that. So maybe for us, let me let me structure that around the main principles that we have for RENA. Um, our main principles are inform, assist, mm -hmm. and connect, right? Um, while there is a lot of changes uh, that, are, that are going on and our services always adjust, those three pillars remain the same within RENA. And let me give you a few examples. I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, let me touch on a few. So in our column of inform, what we found um, over the last years is that the information most of our members are looking for um, is funding information. How can they fund their work, uh, either in collaboration with Austrian funding sources or in Austria or in Europe? Everybody wants to know where their money comes from, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, also interested um, in finding out career, de career development opportunities. Um, where can they work? Are there any workshops that will help them along? Um, is there mentoring programs they can be part of? Where can they find tips on grant writing? We have a lot of Austrian collaboration partners um, that support us with, with webinars in these fields, right? Um, and also in the same column still, we know that people wanna stay up to date on developments in science, technology, and innovation. Um, in Austria and in Europe, um, many of them want to go back at some point um, and they don't want to lose touch. Mm -hmm. So that's the inform column. Um, the assist column, the second one, um, it's really anything there that you can think of that a researcher may need while they're starting out in North, North America or while they're developing their career in North America. Um, over the years, it's been formalities such as helping people with visa extensions, dual citizenship questions. Um, giving them a platform maybe um, to showcase their research. You know, we do poster sessions, um, also work with journalists that do interviews to present researchers' work as well. Um, anything that you can think of that somebody may need that wants to be in touch with Austria still to showcase um, their research or to, to advance their careers. Um, and the third major area of the column that, that we focus on with Rena is to connect and that's maybe the most important one. We not only connect our researchers with each other, the scientists within the network, but also we connect them with the Austrian counterparts that can be Austrians at universities, research funding agencies, um, our ministries very often, uh, there is interest in that quite a bit, um, so that they can initiate research collaboration and think about what it is that they want to do in the future. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of researchers have, have reached out to us recently um, who want to become to a mentor to a young Austrian coming to the United States. Um, and since you mentioned virtual events earlier, maybe I can do a little plug here. Um, we host a lot of networking events as well, and our annual conference, our virtual conference is coming up um, on September 17th, 12 p.m. Eastern time. So if you're interested, please join us for ERIT, the Austrian Research and Innovation Talk. Um, information is available on our website and maybe Daria we can share it also. We can share it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. So save the date for that. 
Yeah, uh, um, I also want to say that when you, uh, we are also going to share the links, your LinkedIn, the, some of the points that you mentioned during our talk, we also, uh, you know, forward the links to our audience. So they are all, okay. you, they can click on now and look at, or later on, we will also send them to our follow-up webinar email. Uh, so, so please feel free to reach out to me, anybody out there, if you have questions later on, uh, if you need support, if you want me to guide you to the right stakeholders in Austria and Europe, uh, reach out to me directly. Thank you, Simone. So uh, my other question is, you said earlier that you change those services regularly and it's not easy because all the circumstances are changing very quickly. So do you tailor them to the needs of your members? Isn't it difficult? I mean, yeah. because you have thousands of members. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we do put a lot of effort into finding out how the needs of our researchers change. And um, a good opportunity are usually one-on-one -on -one conversations that I'm having with people, but also discussions at annual events or at our networking events where we get to speak to the researchers directly and find out what it is that is currently important in their lives. Um, we have a lot of formalized feedback loops as well. You know, you can imagine us sending a questionnaire, a survey. Um, we've been using sometimes Google Forms for just a quick red or blue, yes or no kind of question scenario. Um, and in the past, we've also put resources behind funding studies. Um, actually done by some of our scientists to find out what the other scientists are looking for in our network. And um, we do put a lot of work into adapting our programs and services so that they fulfill those needs. If you're looking today, you know, COVID-19, um, it's had a big effect on researcher mobility, uh, on student yeah. exchange programs. Yeah. yeah, we have Marshall Plan fellows coming here, uh, Austrian Fulbright grantees who are coming to the United States. Um, also, funding for life sciences has changed a lot. There is many new calls and grants that are emerging and coming, coming up on a daily basis, right? So mm -hmm. with things changing regularly in that field, um, we're trying to take that into consideration while we're working on supporting our scientists. Yeah, I, it sounds you, uh, I mean, it sounds that that's a lot of work, right? And uh, <laughs> in what way do you think having a scientist network like yours can help countries like Austria? Oh dear, networks like those are priceless. Uh, networks like Rina are priceless. Look, um, Austria is really proud, extremely proud of the accomplishments that our researchers here in North America have, right? We support them no matter where they're located and with what they need. Um, I, I've seen through through the years that scientist networks such as RENA provide um, excellent frameworks for countries and for nations. Uh, those networks keep the scientists engaged with their home countries. They provide them with support. Um, you know, that's important for keeping up those connections with expats. It's quite mm -hmm. an important thing for countries. You don't want to lose touch to those people that, that matter. Um, and scientist networks are also the root of fostering scientific exchange, academic corporations across borders, you know, that's what helps us getting people together. If we didn't know where our scientists were, how can we connect an Austrian university who wants to do research maybe with a university here in New York, for example, um, and say, look, is there anybody, a point of contact that we have that we can reach out to so that an Austrian researcher in a lab in the US can maybe collaborate with an Austrian researcher in Austria? So that's excellent. Um, and, and, and Daria, you know, having those experts and, and knowing who those people are, it also gives us an, a huge, massive talent pool that, that truthfully, um, we as Austria can tap when we're looking to fill R&D roles. And, and with those scientists, we have hundreds of little, you know, um, hundreds of experts at our fingertips when we need them. I, uh, talking about COVID, right? I, um, I have another current example of that. Uh, maybe that illustrates it. Um, you know, just at the beginning of COVID, when 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 media started reporting on it, I had an Austrian media outlet reach out to me, and they wanted to find experts that were working in the field and could give expert advice. And um, what we did with Rena is we sent out one email, one single email. Within a few hours, um, we had over two dozen Austrian researchers 
wow. contact us and volunteer their expertise. And that's mm -hmm. beautiful because, you know, those people were immunologists, virologists, economists, analysts, uh, mm -hmm. sociologists. Also, I had some people that work in education that wanted to share information on how to adapt your in-person curricula to an online version. Um, people in the tech field that are working on new startups and opportunities. So we had those wonderful people share their expertise with our Austrian stakeholders. Um, and I have to say, without Rena, it would be impossible um, mm -hmm. to identify those experts. And that's why I think it's super important for countries, not just our small Austria, but you know, any country, um, yeah. to keep track of where their researchers are and to support them so that you know when it's time for for them to to do something for you they're so willing and so 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 happy to do that yeah i mean simon it's really important and because you're telling uh, something very important about science-based advice mechanisms in domestic and international affairs because these scientists are all willing to share their background experience knowledge with the other stakeholders and it's for me it's really an important mission and you help them to come together and then because if they don't have a network like this it might be really impossible to get all these you know uh, advice or expertise and you so, know they help each other they help each other i have so many scientists um that support each other advance in their careers and it's just beautiful to watch that yeah, it's it's really wonderful. So I will just uh, ask another question. Perhaps our audiences are a bit uh, wondering about the career path, right? Uh, so uh, we have a right, you know, very uh, wide range of audience, like students, diplomats, researchers. And uh, in your opinion, who can be a science diplomat? What do you think? Okay, you just mentioned students, diplomats, and researchers in the audience. No, okay, there's so many. Right. So, <laughs> okay, so let me actually let me actually take this question and maybe roll it over uh, sure. and ask the audience who they think can be a science diplomat. Uh, if we can do, I think the system allows us to do a quick poll of who can be a science diplomat. Let's put the okay, students, then. the researchers, the diplomats, maybe also policy experts. Um, and maybe one option that allows us to say all of them. All right, yeah. so who can be a science diplomat? Yes. Select one of the following. Students, researchers and scholars, policy experts, diplomats, and all of the above. All right, yeah. attendees, I see I have so many people here. Let me know what it is that you think. And in the meantime, I'm gonna maybe speak a little bit about science diplomacy, which you know I know is a term that's very hip right now. Uh, and very interesting right now to people, but it's actually a concept that developed after World War II when um, yeah. countries saw that it's maybe not so easy to go battle the challenges that each of them have, the big challenges that we have globally on their own, and they wanted to join forces. All right, I see a lot of answers are coming in. Excellent. Let's see. Yeah, we are going to see the 90% of votes. I think we have probably everybody who wanted to vote already voting. All right, let's go through this. Science diplomats, yes. we have here is answers. Zero per, uh, it just popped away. Oh, there you go. Okay. No, so we, we have 0% students, 7% researchers and scholars, 2% policy experts, 5% diplomats, and 85% all of the above. Yep. All of you are right. It's all of the <laughs> above. Everybody, <laughs> everybody that's listed here, uh, even students, um, yeah. can be science diplomats. You know, science diplomats work right at the intersection um, between science and between diplomacy and um you look at my non-traditional career path right as a science diplomat and i believe that they come from a variety of backgrounds um in fact let, let me state that i think you know science diplomats a, lo a lot of what you all know is that they're either state actors and that can be your foreign minister, we just had Secretary of State Pompeo visit Austria, that can be your ambassador, that can be your professional diplomat, a science attaché. But mm -hmm. it can also be non-state actors there, yeah. Um, that's then scientists or scholars, even students, um, policy experts uh, that maybe work at, at the think tanks or a government, um, people working at nonprofit, uh, nonprofit organizations, and also 
science administrators at universities, right? So I want to point out that um, you know everybody who's at the intersection and who wants to make a difference at the intersection of science and diplomacy can be a science diplomat. Um, I, I saw one of the questions uh, that I glimpsed here. It says something about career and diplomacy. So uh, just to say that um, I think you rarely find when you're looking at job postings the title of science diplomat. It's a variety of job titles that you can look into. Project manager, an expert, a policy yes. expert, an advisor, um, the science counselor roles we've talked about. So it's really about going deep and looking at which institution, which organization can help you fulfill that desire to, to, to have a positive change internationally um, in the science field. Uh, so I think um, to the original question, right? Um, who can be a science diplomat? I think everybody can. Um, yeah. Being a diplomat is different. There's traditional career paths, but science diplomat, um, a lot of different people can if they just want to. Okay, thank, thank you. But I'm still wondering, uh, I mean, if you can explain what being a science diplomat means for you. Of course, it might be a well, bit a science science diplomat means, for okay. everybody, but what is involved in <sighs> You know, when yeah. you ask another diplomat, perhaps you will get another answer. You know, this is but, uh, <laughs> your uh, your idea. Well, science diplomacy is using scientific collaborations among different countries, among different nations, so um, that we can address common problems and we can build constructive and international partnerships. And when I'm talking common problems, um, those include things that we're battling right now climate change, energy security, aging populations, um, health crises such as the, the COVID-19 pandemic that we're facing right now, right? Um, and I just mentioned earlier when the question came in, uh, when we were looking at science diplomacy, the concept of science diplomacy is one that's been around for quite some time, but um, I think in 2010, 2010 uh, the um, AAAS in Washington DC, the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, teamed up with the Royal Society in London, and they decided that it's time to give science diplomacy a structured framework. Mm -hmm. um, they identified and defined the three main dimensions in science diplomacy, um, and that's being widely used right now. And, and, and you know, these three um, dimensions often interlap, but let me give you a quick overview of those. So maybe it makes it a bit more clear of, of what the science diplomat actually does. Um, the first dimension is diplomacy for science. And this is where this, the diplomats facilitate international cooperation so that they can advance scientific goals. Um, for example, you're looking at, at, at countries, the area where um, they're joining forces so that they can purchase large instruments or do large research projects together or share infrastructure. Um, that happens, and, and many of you know uh, CERN um, that comes to mind here. CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear, Nuclear Research, and um, it's uh, one of the world's largest uh, centers for scientific research, where so many people and so many countries are involved. And um, the 23 members, Austria is one of them, by the way, and US has observer status. Um, they want to bring light into particle physics and, and focus on knowledge transfer. So uh, that's that's maybe a very good example of how science diplomats can get involved, right? That's a huge project where many countries are, are being connected and diplomats facilitate those international collaborations, those agreements, those treaties, those negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, there is also, um, the next dimension that is science for diplomacy and the approach here the point of view here is a little bit different this is where the scientists and science can help improve relationships between countries and nations that may be in conflict with each other for one reason or the other um uh, we just saw a couple of weeks ago um two U u.s astro astronauts returned from um iss the international space station um the iss is a multinational collaborative project between space agencies and you have countries in there like 
the Russian Space Agency and the US Space, Space Agency, NASA, where the countries maybe don't get along so well on a mm -hmm. formal field, right? But um, it's a multi uh, multinational collaborate, collaborative pro, pro project um, where so many countries do great work together. Um, and, and the third dimension, which is super important right now, also with look, looking at the COVID-19 pandemic again, um, that where science informs diplomacy. So science provides advice and information so that we and policymakers can develop policies. And, and um, I just mentioned COVID-19, right? Um, a lot of government players at the moment work with scientists and groups of scientists um, from across the globe to help them develop protocols on how to deal with, with the current pandemic and, and vaccine development. So this is really where the government players are focusing on the content the information that science and scientists can provide for them. Um, and, and if I may, you know, in essence, I think that all three dimensions play a very significant role also for Austria and, and for Austria's priorities in science diplomacy. Um, for, for, for the main question that you asked earlier, the science diplomat, right? I think the science diplomat is the professional who, who builds those strong international relationships so that all of us ultimately then can tackle those global problems together. Um, I know it's a bit transparent uh, <laughs> uh, or, or, or big, but if, if, if you're looking at those examples that I mentioned, maybe you can see that what being a science diplomat is, is quite the worst in a broad field. Yeah, I think you really summarized the dimensions very well by giving so many good examples, what you know, from the world and from your country. And um, you also speak of uh, students, as I know, young researchers, you have a very good connections with them. You support them through RENA, right? Uh, and uh, what would you recommend uh, to a young person uh, in the earlier stage of his or her education <laughs> who wants to get more involved in, uh, you know, science diplomacy, science policy. Yeah, yeah because people are really um, wanting this and they want to be take more roles in this field. Yeah, so you may or may not have seen me give a presentation to, uh, to younger people. I, I often like to show a picture of a chameleon. Um, yeah, I, I want to. I, I think that one point. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I think that young scientists, whether they're staying in research or whether they're considering a role in science diplomacy, um, in today's complex and fast-changing world, the young researchers face a lot of pressure to succeed, and they have to reinvent themselves quite often. To me, the chameleon is like the, the excellent example for that. Um, mm -hmm. My advice, and, and this may sound quite cheesy now, right? Uh, but it really would be to, to stretch out your wings, be interested in a variety of different things, be open to opportunities, especially to those that you know may at the moment not seem like a great fit for you because oftentimes those grow into those life-changing moments and opportunities that you're all looking for. Um, and maybe, if I may, um, I also want to remind all of us to, to never lose sight of our initial internal mm -hmm. motivation, why we choose, why we chose to work in science in the first place. And for you, Daria, and for myself, and for, for many in the field, um, I know that it is because we want to make a difference in the world. And I think for me, it's very important to not lose sight of that while we're, while we're walking, working in that field. Mm, thank, thank you, Simone. I think you're really right and they're very important. I mean, what you're saying, because many people are now trying to find what is really important for them, what they really want to do. Um, so thank you so much, Simone. And uh, for me, it was a really dynamic and engaging talk. Um, <clears throat> Thanks, Daria. It's a pleasure to be with you. I really enjoyed those questions. And also, <laughs> again, please let me remind people, um, if we don't get to all the questions, I see a lot of them popping up uh, in the chat box. And we also yeah. got a bunch of questions ahead of time. Reach out to me directly via email or LinkedIn. Um, and I'll be happy to get to those if we don't have enough time for, for today. Yes, it seems that it's going to be like this because we are ne nearly reaching, you know, I mean, 
our time we are finishing uh, but still we have some time to answer the questions but before that I just want to say a few words about science diplomacy as well. You, you're right. I mean, science diplomacy is a, uh, it's not in, in the history, but as a concept, I mean, in international relations, it's a new concept. But uh, in realizing, I mean, the uh, connections between the uh, countries and while they're, they use scientific collaborations, you know, many years ago, hundreds of years ago. But as a concept, it's a bit new, and um, it potentially provides very yeah mechanisms and tools to collaborate with, learn from, and mutually enrich each other. And every country has its own perspective, motivation, and policy behind creating joint projects and supporting their networks in other countries. Yeah. Today, we aim to share one of these perspectives from Austria Austrian embassy in Washington DC, but we know that Austria has realizing other projects in other countries, right? Uh, and uh, for me, uh, I can say that this is also one of the aspects of science diplomacy, what you are doing. It's the soft power. I mean, this is a very strong soft power and it can be realized, uh, I mean, analyzed under the science for diplomacy, as you also mentioned, uh, Simon. It seems that all of these efforts realized by OSTA additionally have developed the soft power of Austria besides the other aspects of science diplomacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, we are nearly at the end of our talk. So let's, and now it's time to hold some questions. Yeah, if we still have time, I'd love to take a few questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first question is, what's your experience during social media uh, using social media as a tool for science communication and science diplomacy? Well, science communication is key for what scientists do on a daily basis. And, and with that, it's also key for what we do as science diplomats. If, if we don't communicate it there, you know that if we can't transport information in a way that everybody can consume it, it, it didn't happen and it's not relevant to the world. Um, it's also where actually we have been uh, hosting workshops on um, science communications and also holding scientific poster sessions so that young RENA members can practice and can show us what they do in regards to science communications. Um, mm -hmm. With that said, the social media specifically for us at OSTA, we've, we've, we've dabbled with various social media tools in the last years and, and through analytics and looking at the data, we've determined that for us and for our stakeholders, Twitter and LinkedIn are the most important ones. And those are the two tools that we use um, to communicate mm -hmm. with our stakeholders. Um, um, and I think, um, yeah, that, that would be a good opportunity as well. Um, and good tools for science diplomacy, I think, is specifically that you asked for. I don't see yeah. the question. Yeah. 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 So another question, thank you, oh, by the way. Uh, yeah. How can science diplomacy offer career development opportunities to senior researchers without permanent positions? How can science diplomacy offer career development opportunities career to development. senior researchers without mm -hmm. permanent positions? Right. So um, I think I mentioned briefly earlier that I think that yeah. positions often aren't um, listed as such. They are not listed as science diplomat. Maybe they're they're listed as um, as an analyst, as a project manager, as an expert, as a coordinator. I think what's really important for you, no matter whether you're a senior researcher or a junior researcher wanting to make a difference, is to look at the fields and maybe the, 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 the general organizations where those positions are available. Um, government and on a policy level, right? In Austria, the Foreign Service, in the United States, the Department of State. Um, if you wanna work at a governmentally funded institution here in the United States, I have NIH right down the road here uh, and it's part of the National Science Foundation. Um, there's lots of nonprofit organizations focusing on the environment, on eradicating diseases like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, here in Washington, there is, you know, we have so many uh, NGOs, um, think tanks, the AAAS uh, actually, who, who's become the voice for researchers. If you want to work in science diplomacy, those would be excellent opportunities to look at. And 
And certainly, since we have so many uh, students and researchers from universities here, um, look at those look look at those roles at your university where you can foster engagement and international collaboration, either in your specific field or on a general level with the with the international departments mm -hmm. and so on. Um, the policy uh, courseworks, uh, etc. So I think uh, it's quite broad. You've got to be a little a little creative if you're looking for um, science diplomacy career roles, um, junior or senior researcher. I think it doesn't matter. Yeah. Another question is, uh, what are the opportunities for pursuing a career in research and development in the US, Austria, for foreigners? Mm -hmm. huh. Well, in Austria in general? Uh, can, this, can you repeat that again? What are the opportunities for pursuing a, car a career in research and development in the US, Austria, uh -huh. for foreigners? Okay, so well, research opportunities in Austria mainly are at universities and the biggest uh, and the business sector. Those are the biggest research performers in Austria. Um, mm -hmm. We also have opportunities in government, nonprofit organizations. But I think if you're looking at university and private industry, that would be key. For example, mm -hmm. in Austria, at our public universities, we have over a thousand research entities alone that are accepting applications from international um experts uh, and and if you're looking at um you know our private industry we have over 7000 companies that are doing r&d in austria and the small uh, and medium companies that we have um it's over 4000 businesses that do r&d um and and austria is also a country um where we have a lot of research clusters i think it's 50 or 60 by now and all those sectors are growing so it just Mm -hmm. For whoever asked that question, right? It just depends certainly um, on what sector you're looking for, the type of role that you're looking for, an opportunity. Um, in regards to career opportunities, I think, uh, and finding opportunities as well, I, I, I'm glancing a few here uh, in the question feed. Um, feel free to go to our website at ostaustria.org. We have a field there that's called ST in Austria, where we're providing resources, job mm -hmm. platforms from the Austrian Science Fund, for example. Uh, even your access, I think, the uh, um, Darian, your access job platform is linked there mm -hmm. as well, right? And and reach out to me and we can help you find those specific opportunities in Austrian R and D um if, if you don't find them through those resources. Okay, so I, I wanna Go on with the other questions a bit quickly, Simone, because we have so many questions and I really want to ask especially two or three of them after this question. And uh, sure. the other question is experience in food science, food industry collaborations and international programs, including working with University of Graz, Graz Technical University uh -huh. and the Fulbright program. So what can you tell us about this? Very quickly. Well, I think you're referring to the uh, to the relationship between the U.S. and Austria that we've built when it comes to researcher mobility. Um, the Austrian Fulbright program has existed now. We're actually in our anniversary year, 70 years, um, and Austria and the United States are exchanging scholars, students, and teaching assistants so that uh, they can share their expertise and experiences. Um, I think the specific program that you referred to is a visiting professorship. Those are typically four-month grants, I think, and the award is allowing for a combination of teaching, research, and also advising students. Um, and current applications are going on through mid-September right now for the for the uh, fall, I think, 2021 and the spring 2022 period. Um, you were mentioning cards. Uh, Daria. Um, so I think this specific award is actually referring to the Navi Card, mm -hmm. Natural Sciences uh, Universities, where a few dozen institutes from the tech, uh, Technical University Cards and the University Cards are, are collaborating to focus uh, on natural sciences, uh, specifically biotech, plant sciences. I think you mentioned uh, the plant sciences specifically in your question, chemistry, the environmental sciences. Um, so whoever asked that question, please feel free to reach out and, and send me a message and I'll be happy to direct you either to the call or connect you with the person that's actually working on the call in Austria. Thank you for okay. that question. Good one. Thank you. Well, Thank it's you. important for the relationship between Austria and the United States. United States. And thank you. Uh, there's another uh, question is, 
what are Austria's top priorities now in science diplomacy? It is uh, so. Uh, for for so for Austrian for Austrian priorities, um, to us it is key to look across. We call it the Tellerrand in Austria, right? We don't want to just look at what's happening in Austria, but at other countries. We've put a lot of focus on the Eastern world, but also the United States is a, the United States, Canada, and Mexico are a big uh, are a big focus. And international collaborations when it comes to researcher mobility is one of the the programs where a lot of um, effort and also funding comes in. Um, the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation, uh, we have Erin Schrodinger grants where Austrian researchers are sent here uh, and also the Fulbright Austria program. So I think when you're talking about the um, maybe key focus that would be, uh, one of them would certainly be the, the researcher mobility that allows us then to exchange knowledge and expertise and build long-term relationships between the research institutes in those two countries. Mm -hmm. yes. Sure. So, yeah, now, there are other questions, but we really ex we are really exceeding our time. Unfortunately, we are not going to cover all the questions. Uh, Again, please, everybody who asked questions or if I didn't understand it correctly and responded to something else, uh, do feel free to send me a message later on uh, and I'll be happy to elaborate as well. Thank you, Simone. Thank you again for joining us today. And I really enjoyed our chat and learned a lot about your projects, your responsibilities, the functions of OSTA and other career, your career path. And also we got some suggestions from you. It's, it was really very valuable for, for me and, and for audience as well. And uh, we are almost yeah. finishing, yeah. And we are all uh, almost finishing our coffees. Uh, I mean, so, sorry, my coffee and your tea. And uh, thank you for sharing your email, your LinkedIn address and your re recipe with us. I mean, you're going to share uh, later <laughs> on. I'll be happy you. to whoever is interested. Yeah. And please reach out Simone directly if you have further questions. And uh, for our kickoff interview, our kickoff interview was with Dr. Mary Kavana from the EU delegation in the US. Today we hosted Simone uh, from the Austrian Embassy in Washington, DC. I would like to invite you to sign up for our next edition taking place in September 17th, at, uh, interviewing Christian Jorgens, the Minister Counselor of Head of uh, Section Science and Technology, Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany. You can see it mm -hmm. now in the chat box. We are going to share it, the registration email um, linked also with you. We will see, uh, we will also share it with you in the webinar follow-up email as well. So thank you all once again, and we hope to see you next month. Thank you, Suman, again. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure, Daria. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. Thank you. Bye-bye.